be dressed, uh, me and my siblings up in um, 12 different outfits representing the different months of the year. And we went up down the house and walked out and walked down the street. And even at that time, I thought about this issue about this the, the disjuncture between representation, documentation, and fiction, and how is it participating in something like that. And um, my visual arts practice has really been uh, involved in those questions. And what I'm going to do in the 20 minutes that we've got here is to look at the way technology and representation have developed since my mother took these pictures. And uh, a couple of artists that I think have done some really interesting work along the way. Um, the question of how the, the process of documentation changes the, the, the thing documented was really first seriously posed in the 70s when theorists began to um, challenge documentarians to understand and integrate into their work their self-referential position and agenda. And the mandate to identify your point of view within your documentary work was really a, a, a means to take responsibility for your subjective perspective and to acknowledge that your documentary material told really as much about yourself um, as those you were, you were documenting. Today, I think the incorporation of, of self-referentiality into the documentary process has really become a corporate strategy. The makers of the technologies that we use want to know who we are um, and where we are when we use their devices to record the world around us um, and put them in various social media sites so that they can better market their products. Um, and uh, I think the social media is really the ultimate sort of self-referential uh, realization of this mandate from the 70s. Um, but early on in the 70s, um, there was a video artist like this, this is Martha Rossler, who used the low-res raw material of video, which is, this was a quarter-inch open reel-to-reel -reel video port pack by Sony. No one had ever heard the, the, the name Sony. Um, and um, artists gravitated towards this really raw material um, because it really offered an alternative to the dominant structures of the art world, gender politics, Hollywood, television, and traditional authoritative documentary. Um, this is the semiotics of the kitchen. Um, and these artists really refuted uh, traditional narrative structures. Um, image quality, notions of beauty, they weren't interested in that at all, and instead used the plastic and sculptural elements of video um, to explore the power dynamics of representation. And this work is the foundation for a lot of the work that I think is being done today by artists that are uh, engaged in representation and socially engaged practice. <laughs> She would do these um, on cable television access networks as well. She was really wonderful. She's still a, a practicing artist today, wonderful. Um, 10 years later, in the, in the 80s, the technology really developed so that artists were gaining access to uh, the video quality that replicated what was familiar in television. Um, places like the Bay Area Video Coalition, which is still alive today, but uh, quite a different organization, provided artists with the tools um, uh, of the industry, and some artists use these tools to really infiltrate the industry. And probably no one did that better than Marlon Riggs. Um, Marlon was trained at Harvard and started the uh, uh, film document, uh, documentary program in the journalism school at Berkeley. And his goal was to insert personal and the self-referential into the public landscape of the television audience. He made beautifully crafted traditional documentaries that no one would bat an eye at. And then he also created pieces like this, Tongues Untied, um, which um, uh, when after it was broadcast nationally on PBS, Jesse Helms, took a clip from it and used it in a commercial to defund um, uh, PBS. And Tons Untied became the central flashpoint in the culture wars <coughs> of the 80s and 90s. Um, I'm going to show you a two-minute clip 
um, just to give you a little bit of a feel of what this what this film was like. You know why we do this? And I always get our arms free to do this. I heard my calling by age six. We had a word for boys like me. Punk. Punk. Not because I played sex with other boys. Everybody on the block did that. Punk. But because I didn't mind giving it away. Now other boys traded. You can have my booty if you give me yours. Mm -mm. But uh, wait a minute now. If I go first, uh-uh, you went first last time. But, but, but I want to be the daddy. You, you the daddy all the time. But, but I want to be the daddy. I'm the daddy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not me. I gave it up free. Punk. At age 11, we moved to Georgia. I graduated to new knowledge. Homo. You don't know how to kiss? Homo. My best friend asked, shocked. I didn't know what to do with a girl when I lost that spin the bottle. Homo. I'll show you, he said, his brown eyes inviting. We practiced kissing for weeks, dry, wet French, till his older brother called us a name. Homo. What's a homo? I asked. Punk. Fight. Free. I understood. We stopped kissing. Best friend became worst enemy. Motherfucking cunt. Age 12, they bust me to Hepzibah Junior High on the outskirts of Augusta. Motherfucking cunt. A spray-painted sign on the wall greeted me. Niggas, go home. The rednecks hated me. Motherfucking cunt. Because I was one of only two blacks placed in 8A, the class for Hepzibah's best and brightest. Niggas, go home. The blacks hated me. Uncle Tom. Because they assumed my class status made me uppity. Uncle Tom. Assumed my silence. A superiority. Uncle Tom. I was shy. Motherfucking cunt. Uncle Tom. I was confused. Motherfucking cunt. Uncle Tom. Niggas, go home. I was afraid and alone. Motherfucking cunt. Uncle Tom. Punk. Fight. Niggas, Free. go home. Home. Punk. Motherfucking cunt. Uncle Tom. Punk. Fight. Homo. Niggas, Free. go home. Cornered by identities I never wanted to claim. I ran. Fast, hard, deep inside myself, where it was still, silent, safe, deception. So the goal of these works, I think, um, was to embed self-referentiality and self-reference reference within the very language of the mainstream to really insert radical positions into mainstream and give voice to, on, on, a, on a very, very public level, give voice to people who were otherwise silent. And I think Jesse Helms' reaction meant that, you know, Marlon was actually really, really quite successful. The upshot of it was that Marlon ended up suing Helms, and um, he won. So that was that was good. Um, in the '90s, uh, the Hi8 camera allowed an individual to suddenly record the world with a small device that really had really good image quality, and for the first time, you could go out without bulky cameras. And, and the beginning of what we have today, which is the ubiquity of uh, constant self-documentation, began. Um, this is uh, the Rodney King video of the police beating, um, which was photographed by a passerby. Uh, the ability to challenge the narrative of the police or a corporation or the government by recording the world shifted the power dynam dynamics considerably, and now you know police wear um, cameras on their helmets, so they too can record. Um, this is a, what you have here is a CNN broadcast of the lawyers explaining how they presented this 90 seconds of video to, footage to the jury to prove the officers innocent, and in this trial, the officers were acquitted. So I'll just play a little bit of this. On over to the strong end again. You'll see Mr. King's leg cocking. It's the right leg. He's getting up again, and the officers resume uh, baton blows to keep him on the ground. And now, whether or not Mr. Braceno's um, foot action, stomp, 
whatever you want to call it, or whether that was justified or not depends on his perceptions and whether those perceptions were reasonable and whether what he did was reasonable. He gave his explanation of that at trial. Officer Powell was only reacting with, to what Mr. King was doing. And Mr. Stone, as part of the trial strategies, we had... It's, it's a full half hour, and um, it's, it's really... Uh, totally fascinating look at how the lawyers could present this documentary footage uh, that was clearly someone being beaten brutally and how they were able to present it in such a way to acquit the, the officers. Um, I'm really fascinated by our work, contemporary world where technology and uh, encourages consumers to blue, blur the personal and the public into this kind of untethered landscape that we live in. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring the dynamics and power structures of this landscape by investigating both the physical world and the virtual world through representational media. Um, I'm really compelled, I think, to make work and consider the work of others that disrupts this frequently unnoticed intersection. This is an exhibition that was at the Tate um, with a group of artists. Um, uh, one of the, and I'll talk a little bit about this artist who is um, Dennis Bocqua. Um, one of the most ubiquitous methods today of constructing representational portraits and imagery is through data mining, so I was really interested in the artificial intelligence. We participate in that process, you know, whenever we use our computers, as you all know, whenever we walk past a surveillance camera, and it's too late to really imagine that you can avoid it. But um, artists that in, interact and subvert this reality and this, and this situation or play with it is something that I find really compelling. Um, Bogua here, um, this is a piece called In the Event of Amnesia, The City Will Recall. And he created this relationship between uh, the individual and the metropolis by selecting 12 surveillance camera sites in Sydney and then did daily pilgrimages with a bunch of people um, to the sites where performers performed and acted out and engaged with the electronic eye, creating this, this disruption of the, the, the uh, general relationship of a passive um, passerby. Um, my long relationship with documentary practice is really born out of a love for gathering stories in which the subjects um, of the stories are part of the creative process, and I sing with the Threshold Choir. It's an all-women's a cappella choir, and we sing at bedside for hospice and palliative care. I recently did a project with my choir and Mel Day where we sang with the residents from the Litton Gardens Nursing Home here at, uh, in Palo Alto for uh, quite some time, volunteered there, and then we put on this participatory concert with the, with the residents. And we work with Jonathan Abel from Karma here at Stanford's um, you know, music lab. Jonathan uses a balloon pop to record the acoustic signature of a, of a space and then is able to apply that acoustic signature to recorded material. So um, he came to our event at the nursing home and while we were singing, he applied the acoustic signature of the Stanford Memorial Church to um, the concert. So it sounded in this, you know, cement small room of the nursing home, it sounded as if we were singing at the Stanford Memorial Church, which was kind of wonderful. And for the residents who can't really move, you know, it was a way of transporting this relationship. And music and song is, you know, very much about trans transportation. We then took the footage from the concert and edited it into a three-channel video that went in the gallery with surround sound. And music is something that really easily inhabits this border between the public and the private. Um, I'm interested in how song traverses uh, public and private spaces, particularly in the work that I'm doing with my choir. It's really an incredible honor to do that work. The situations are deeply, deeply intimate, and yet I generally do not know the people uh, for whom and with whom I am singing. Um, and in this work that we did here with, with, with Jonathan and the Stanford Memorial Church, we tried to use both song and technology to <coughs> traverse multiple sites and in the process uh, traverse this, 
deeply private yet ultimately public reality of dying. Um, uh, this spring, um, I worked on a show at the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art with my longtime collaborator, John Muse, who's a really um, just a fabulous artist, and I've been working with him for 20 years now. Um, the curator asked us, uh, all the artists in the show, to imagine the perfect city, and the gallery opened empty and was filled during the duration of the show. We, John and I, imagined how the perfect city would memorialize its citizens, and we began documenting over 80 vernacular memorial sites in the northern half of the state of Delaware. Um, these sites are public and they're tied to site, but they're very tied to that site, also makes them vulnerable and ephemeral. And in 2006, uh, roadside memorials were outlawed in Delaware because they're unsightly, because they pose hazardous conditions when people go near them, and they're difficult to maintain the public land that surrounds them when, when they are on that land. Um, and so what, they, what the state of Delaware did was is they created a um, memorial garden at the Smyrna rest stop, which is off the interstate that runs north-south of, of uh, Delaware. And it's really beautiful, and um, um, it's kind of a wonderful place to be, but it completely separates the memorial uh, from the site, which is the primary intent of the vernacular memorials. Um, so in the gallery, we created a whole series of invitations for all of the, um, the uh, uh, memorials that we found. I think total, we clocked something like, uh, oh, you know, thousands and thousands of miles finding these memorials. Um, and viewers took the invitation. Um, if they took an invitation, it was, a, it was a commitment, in a sense, on their part to go visit the memorial. And they did that. They visited the memorial. Then they emailed us with images and their impressions of what that memorial was. And in the gallery, uh, we projected a, a very, very simple video. And there's a map over there also that includes some of the, um, that includes all of the sites that we um, uh, 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 had photographed. And the, um, the video is just a combination of the photographs with the audio landscape of the site. We uh, contrasted the government-sponsored memorial garden with the vernacular site. So I'll just let this run for three, two or three memorials. Ultimately, I'm really compelled by the stories that we hear and we tell each other. And I want to end this talk sort of where I began it by asking this question of how does the process of representation and documentation change and affect the subject that is being documented? And how does it bind the, the, the person who is recording to their subject? Um, I was uh, in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts, and um, I came across this boat named Fat Chance, and it was grounded, marooned on the beach there. And by chance, my camera was rolling while the salvage crew came and um, hauled it back out to sea and then back through the Golden Gate. And I didn't do anything with the footage until five years later when I researched what had happened. 
and I learned that it had been uh, hit by a rogue wave. It was a graduation trip. Two fathers and three boys who had graduated from high school were um, sailing from San Francisco back home to Portland. And it was hit by a rogue wave, and one of the sons was killed. Um, so I began editing the footage together of the boat and telling the story, and I realized that I couldn't really do that unless I contacted the crew. And um, that was, I think, probably the hardest phone call I've ever made in, you know, in the, all the years I've been working. But um, in the end, um, it was a really uh, rewarding and, I think, dynamic experience for both the crew and myself. Because I entered the, interviewed them less about what had happened, because I kind of knew that, but um, and more about how, what was it like. I'd sent them a rough cut of the footage. I interviewed them about what was it like to look at this footage, and how did that change their experience um, of that event. And um, uh, uh, one of the fathers articulated to me uh, his relationship with being able to see the footage this many years later. Um, by that point it was six years later, um, had actually liberated him from a whole host and set of feelings about, about the, the, um, the, the event. Um, so the film then is less about the event, although it includes some of that information, and it's really more about this process of, of representational uh, imagery and its its effect um, on those who were a part of this boat accident. And I just literally finished the film this week, so it'll be showing in the coming months here in the Bay Area. So thank you very much. Questions.